Welcome to Pesticide Action Network International's webinar, Agroecology, Farmers' Pathways to Liberation from Pesticides. This is an international webinar and we will have presenters speaking in various languages. So we will provide interpretation in English, French and Spanish. I will provide instructions now on how to access the interpretation and my colleague Rina from Pan UK will give the same instructions in French and Spanish right after I finish. So to enable interpretation, click on the interpretation button at the bottom right of the Zoom window. It looks like a little globe. Uh, choose the language you wish to listen to. If you do not wish to hear the original audio of the person speaking, then click on mute original audio and you'll see that option below in the same drop down menu after the list of languages. On the other hand, if you would like to hear the original audio, that is the, the speaker's own voice, if they're speaking in another language, then either you unclick unmute original audio or you just do not select mute original audio to begin with. So we will also provide these instructions in the chat column after this slide is gone in case you missed it. So please go ahead and choose your language now. The interpretation is already live and available. If you're having any difficulty with accessing the interpretation, then please send a message to us through the chat column and we will do our best to assist. And that chat bottom can be found at the bottom of your screen. And now you'll hear the instructions again in, in Spanish and French from Rina. All right, just um, a couple other things. We have a full agenda today. Um, we hope to have time towards the end of the webinar to take a couple of questions from the audience. So please drop your questions for the panelists into the Q&A box at any time. The Q&A button should be found at the bottom of your screen. Please also feel free to share your comments, reflections and resources in the chat column. We have about 700 participants who registered for the webinar. So it is a wonderful opportunity to share knowledge with each other. With that, let's get started. Maybe aware this is a bit of a complicated situation. We have um, farmers who are joining from Argentina, from Kerala, India, from Benin and from Iowa in the United States. All right, so, well, to introduce myself first, whoops, now that we are all together, I am Marsha Ishii. I am your moderator today. I'm senior scientist at Pesticide Action Network, North America and chair of the Pan International Agroecology Workgroup. To give you a little information about Pesticide Action Network or PAN, we are a global network dedicated to the elimination of environmental and human health harms from pesticide use. And we are working to replace hazardous pesticides with ecological and socially just alternatives. As many of you know, worldwide, large scale chemical intensive industrial agriculture is exhausting our soil, poisoning our water and air, destroying biodiversity, exacerbating the climate crisis and, as well, and devastating the health of communities while driving peasant and family farmers, as well as indigenous communities off of their land. So as a network, PAN is committed to replacing pesticide dependence with transformative food uh, systems change. And this includes eliminating the use of highly hazardous pesticides that are extremely toxic to humans and cause chronic diseases such as cancer or hormone disruption and other negative impacts while also harming ecosystems and the environment. This is a group called Highly Hazardous Pesticides. PAN is demanding action by decision makers, governments, policymakers at all levels to move immediately towards phasing out and ultimately banning these highly hazardous pesticides. So why agroecology? Why does PAN work on agroecology? Well, we see agroecology as offering some of the most robust solutions available to help us move away from the trap of pesticide dependence and the harms of hazardous pesticides. At the same time, uh, we are facing multiple accelerating and converging crises, health, ecological and climate crises, as well as economic, financial and food system crises. So the need to radically rethink, reconceive and change our approach to agriculture 
and really fundamentally our relationship to the earth has become paramount. Agroecology is grounded in local, peasant and indigenous knowledge, as well as in scientific principles and investigation. Agroecology is practical, adaptive and resilient. It's both rooted in ancestral knowledge, but also continually evolving in innovative and creative ways. Furthermore, agroecology is a movement, a social movement for social and ecological justice, and it's a pillar of food sovereignty. These days, increasingly, the United Nations, international institutions and governments are recognizing the power of agroecology to transform our food and farming systems, address these multiple crises and provide us with just and equitable pathways to resilient futures. We have so much to learn from farmers around the world, those who are with us today and many others who are creating both new and reviving old ways of being in community based on principles of agroecology collectivity, reciprocity, and solidarity. So just a little bit of background on PAN. We were founded in Malaysia in 1982, nearly 40 years ago, by activists from 22 countries who had come together around a common purpose, that of stopping multinational corporations from dumping hazardous pesticides banned in the global north, where most of these were being produced, um, into countries of the global south. PAN has since grown into a network of over 600 participating civil society organizations, institutions, and with uh, many individuals joining in as well from over 90 countries. We have five regional centers that are also autonomous, independent with our own governing structures, um, but that come together and work collaboratively in these spaces to lift up and bring the voices of farmers, farm workers, uh, indigenous communities and rural populations to key national and international fora so that their demands and priorities can be centered as together we build viable, vibrant and just solutions. Today, we'll hear directly from farmers in PAN's network whose stories demonstrate their success in eliminating dependence on highly hazardous pesticides and in establishing productive, profitable and resilient agroecological farming systems that not only nourish their families and communities, but also bring them great joy. So we have, us, we have with us today, uh, Ms. Kali Marutan from the Sambarkode Hamlet in Atapadi Valley in Kerala, India, as well as we have Signora Marcela Calderon in the province of Buenos Aires, Argentina. We have Madame Oku Rosaline from the district of Jija in the Republic of Benin and Patty Naylor, who is a family farmer from Iowa in the United States. But meanwhile, we will turn to Signora Marcela in Argentina. Um, and so we'll have a video that we will show from each of the farmers um, countries from their farms, and then we'll have some questions and discussion with them. All right, so hello, dear um, Marcela, Marcela, Signora Marcela, thank you for joining us. So I'd like to introduce Senora Marcela Calderon from Buenos Aires, Argentina. After experiencing the damaging effects of pesticide use on her farm, uh, Senora Marcela and her siblings converted their operations to organic farming and ecological pasture management to provide healthy forage for their animals, as well as healthy food products um, for their community. So first I will share my screen and I will show the video that you made for us. Soy Marcela Calderón, estoy en representación del huerto interior. Nosotros somos agricultores junto con mis hermanos Patricia y Marcos y también eh, mi mamá. Nosotros venimos del de modelo agroindustrial hace 11 años eh, y hoy eh, ya estamos eh, produciendo sin nada de químicos de síntesis, eh, haciendo agroecología con el objetivo de regenerar la vida del suelo. Para esto abordamos lo que sería la ganadería ovina y eh, también mm, generar valor agregado en el lugar eh, produciendo harina integral agroecológica con un molino artesanal a piedra. Les estoy mostrando la siembra asociada de trigo 
arveja y trébol. Acá les voy mostrando la producción ovina con pastoreo racional. Están saliendo a comer. Acá le muestro parte de la huerta, la cusada y los puerros, achicoria, lechuga, un gallinerito móvil. Doble propósito, el monte de frutales de verano. Y bueno, otro gallinerito móvil, doble propósito para criar los pollitos, los pollos. Vamos corriendo del lugar todos Acá los tenemos días. los bancitos, descansando. Acá tenemos las gallinetas o gallinas de guinea acá les presento la plantinera por dentro y les muestro el bancal en altura que hicimos este año para demostrar que en un espacio reducido de 30 centímetros de alto por 1.30 de ancho la diversidad de alimentos que podemos Now we are seeing the beautiful activities of Signora Marcella. Um, my question for you, uh, can you tell us a bit about what your farming, your production was like before you started on the agroecology path? What was the impact you were observing of pesticides on the soil, your farm and surroundings? Um, and how has your transition to organic and agroecology changed things for your family? Hola, buen día en primer lugar a todos y, y agradecer este, a todos ustedes la, la posibilidad de, de hacer visible eh, aún más eh, este modelo. ¿no? Nosotros venimos del modelo agroindustrial, digamos de trabajar 2.500 hectáreas y, y bueno, después de 25 o 30 años de estar eh, haciendo siembra directa, nos dimos cuenta que, digamos, el modelo estaba, este, que ya no daba más. Entonces, eh, empezaron a suceder también eh, situaciones ¿no? dentro del establecimiento y, y empezamos a visibilizar eh, la pérdida eh, de, del buen vivir que teníamos, ¿no? ¿Por qué? Porque el modelo agroindustrial, digamos, eh, te hace uno, podría decir, como, como nómade y también más esclavo ¿no? del, del sistema, y uno pierde calidad de vida. Eso fue el primer replanteo que nosotros no, nos empezamos a hacer, ¿no? Y, y bueno, desde ahí empezamos a tomar esta conciencia también eh, del espacio, ¿no? esto de empezar a leer las señales de la naturaleza y empezar a registrar la pérdida de, eh, de estructura y de vida, digamos, en el suelo. Eh, ese fue, y también, por supuesto, observar eh, la incidencia que estaban teniendo eh, todo lo que serían los químicos de síntesis ¿no? en, eh, en el espacio. Eso fue, digamos, así, eh, a partir de ahí empezamos a transitar, eh, digamos, todo, toda una búsqueda, ¿no? Porque en realidad fue bastante abrupto, digamos, salir de un modelo, digamos, agroindustrial, eh, productivista, a entrar a un modelo, digamos, agroecológico. Nosotros tuvimos que hacer toda una transición de aprendizaje y de educación, o reeducarnos, o volver a regenerarnos para también poder regenerar eh, el, el espacio y, y, y la vida. ¿no? Eh, en, en esta búsqueda digamos, de, de educación, uno empezó a, a, en, a tener otra mirada e incursionar en lo que sería digamos, la permacultura, empezamos a incursionar sobre la agricultura natural de Fucoca, en, eh, también sobre la agricultura... Eh, orgánica, regenerativa, de Jairo Restrepo, la, 
agricultura biodinámica de, de Steiner, eh, la agroecología propiamente dicha, digamos, acá hay un ingeniero agrónomo que, que es como el, el representante o la cara más visible de todo lo que es el movimiento agroecológico en la Argentina, que es el ingeniero Cerdá, que bueno, ahora, eh, este año también fue nombrado y, y fue abierta eh, digamos, un, una parte del, del, del ministerio, es como que se le abrió, el Estado abrió, digamos, esta posibilidad y hacer más visible la agroecología. Y también incursionar sobre la veterinaria, digamos, holística. ¿Por qué? Porque el objetivo nuestro eh, era regenerar la vida del suelo, vivificarlo. Entonces, para esto sabíamos que eh, teníamos que incorporar animales, porque los animales con el estiércol y, y, bueno, y todo lo, el, el desecho iban a estar incorporando la microbiología que nosotros necesitábamos para empezar a vivificar digamos, ese espacio. Y, y bueno, ahí empezamos a hacer eh, parte de lo que serían eh, las pasturas consociadas, trigo con trébol blanco, después en, en este momento estamos haciendo ya pasturas con, con ocho eh, variedades diferentes, eh, y con eh, esas pasturas eh, consociadas se cosecha el trigo en diciembre, por ejemplo, y con ese trigo tenemos el, un molino artesanal a piedra con el que... Eh, Pon, digamos, le damos valor agregado digamos, a, la, a la producción ¿no? de, de trigo. Y el resto de las pasturas lo usamos para lo que sería eh, la ganadería ovina, que la manejamos con pastoreo eh, racional. Thank you so much, señora Marcela. It's lovely to hear about your, your amazing transition. There was a big change you made to organic production. And we will come back to you um, in the second round to hear more about your, how you organize your family on the farm and, and your interaction with the community um, as you've made this shift. But uh, for now, we will move on to uh, another um, one of our panelists and we will be coming back to you uh, in the next round. So thank you um, so much for that sharing. Um, let me see now is, uh, Ms. Kali Marutan, ready? I'm just checking with uh, my colleague, Bartan, uh, who is with the Tanal Trust in Kerala, India. Um, so we will also begin with a video of Ms. Kali Marutan in her home hamlet of Sambarkode in Kerala. Ms. Kali has been practicing the indigenous traditional approach to farming known as Panja Krishi. So now I will, oh, hello. It's Wonderful to see you. Thank you. I know you had to travel and it's late at night uh, for you to come to this office to be able to join us. So I will now show the video, the beautiful video you made for us. Apa de or nal tambu gutu, otogal. Oti anna te curake with take it a little. Mada yagati tambo tonali. Apa pala ille. Hm? Tani di dadi de bogono. Are they casta galagondo nam viva saya to good temu? Muppa the versa, curdis curcia tali. Run the versa is a game. Puna versa mi versa. In it todan the tando is her car sagayangondo. Now, Todan Sevemi Togari Vare Idala M. Sepane Kurta Vesemo, Tanangani, Idu de Namtin the Murunda, Maranda Temuktila, Maranda Vasana Yedia Ur Nagari Ali Adanale de Nella Murekirin there, Ipa Pata, Maranda de Casoret in Unetania, Kivara de Calvara de Muria de la Poga, Adakri, Nam Dag and Sopa de Demo. Hm? Ur Dag Musopa de. If you have a car, you can play with the car. 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 You can play with the 
That is such a beautiful uh, scenes you have provided to us, Ms. Kali. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to ask you some questions uh, about what you shared in the video and your experiences uh, after being away from agriculture for 30 years. I believe you have come back to and revived the indigenous approach of Panja Krishi with others in your community. And now you and your community grow an incredible diversity of crops with around 280 different crops in multiple and complex rotations. This is just amazing. So could you tell us please about Panja Krishi how it guides your approach to farming and of relating to the land. And can you also share with us a bit about your community's return to Panja Krishi, how that has affected uh, you and others in your community since making this decision to come back to this approach? Hello. Can you hear me? I am yes. Baratan. Yes, Baratan. So we will have a translation, consecutive translation. Uh, Ms. Kali yes. speaks the Irula dialect and Baratan will be translating into English for us. Pine sodi berti, pine marbel lama, pine podi gila. Ah, ah hello, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, yes, please proceed. Ah, ma'am, uh, she is saying she is very happy to join with us. Firstly, she is thanking to you, uh, and she is saying about uh, our traditional farming is called panjakrishi. We do this uh, panjakrishi with family, not only single. We will do. Uh, through family. We are cultivating our own lands with our own traditional practices like uh, uh, like uh, man plowing and ox plowing, like seeding, like etc. And this is our traditional uh, agricultural method. We are practicing with 13 varieties of millets farming and vegetables. Hello, Sir Carol. Uh, she is saying uh, she is practicing after 30 years in this last two years and she is she facing some problems regarding wild attacks and climatic change today uh, our first after this uh, our generation this generation is very happy to take over this agriculture thank you very much for sharing that um so I, I guess just to follow on, you, you mentioned the younger generation. Are you, are you seeing that they are engaged in the Panja Krishi approach and they've also come back to, to farming in your area? Can you tell us about the youth uh, participation? <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, uh, she is saying she is very happy to say this because after 30 years I am doing this agriculture. Uh, but uh, today's our younger generation is doing uh, with us like our uh, also they are practicing our traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And they are very happy to do this agriculture because they are uh, this time they are practicing how to do this traditional agriculture. They don't know how to do this traditional agriculture. They are uh, uh, they are now our students. She is saying they are now our students. They are practicing our agriculture and they are very happy to do this. That is wonderful. Uh, I yes, go ahead. Did you have more? Uh, that's enough, ma'am. Oh yes, thank you. That I imagine that Miss Kali is a wonderful teacher and mentor to the the young generation. I'm so happy to hear that they are coming back to this. Many young people move to the city and are not following these practices. So you are quite a model and inspiration uh, for your community and for the young people. Okay, uh, Miss Kali is saying that uh, some youths, I think uh, ten of them. 
ten youths they are practicing their land uh, uh, another land they are took a forest land uh, when uh, after 13 years back mm -hmm. they are doing a new land for this uh, traditional agriculture practice ah, okay that's excellent Thank you very much. Um, we've dropped into a chat also a report from Tanal Trust that describes in much more detail uh, the practices of Panja Krishi um, and the ways in which they incorporate uh, cultural practices and festivals and celebrations, showing that uh, culture and ecology really are interconnected. So thank you. We will come back to you in a moment after we we continue with some of the our other panelists. Thank you, Ms. Kali. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. All right. Now, dear friends, we will move to our panelists from Benin, Madame Oku, Rosaline. Uh, let's see, are we ready to move to Madame Oku? Um, in the same way just now, Madame Oku speaks her own language, a local language, Fongbe, and our colleague in Benin, uh, Ms. Delphine, will be translating, doing consecutive translation from Fongbe into French, for which we are very appreciative. Uh, Delphine is with OBEPAP, the Organization um, of Organic Producers of Benin. So now, Madame Oku, um, just to tell you briefly, she also converted to organic farming after experiencing the harms of highly hazardous pesticides, in particular endosulfan. Some of you may know is a very dangerous chemical that is commonly used in conventional cotton production. As a result of those experiences, she has switched to organic farming, organic cotton, as well as a wide variety of other crops, um, food crops for herself and her family and her community. So first we will um, go to a video um, from Madame Oku. No, you who Rosaline, please say with the tongue by her mind if you come in a jia. No, we are tons on the pojendo, and I will go to the domi. And the men is a wheel, and then they will have the one time be cool over moment. Petamitong so called the canton layer, trend to women. They are more temple font in Bauna, a door, and then also do for the year. I I Amazing and beautiful, such beautiful diversity on your farm, Madame Oku. 
Um, yeah, it's wonderful to see. <coughs> just see. Okay. Uh, so I have my question for you, and just thank you again so much. You had to travel quite a distance to, to join this webinar, over 100, 150 kilometers, I believe, to come to the OPAPOP office. So we are so appreciative of you making that journey. Um, so I would like to ask you, you've had much experience growing cotton and other crops as well both conventionally and now organically, what made you decide to stop using pesticides? What was that uh, point where you decided it was enough and it was time to change? Um, so if you could tell us a bit about that decision and then also what helped you in managing the transition to organic farming? That's a big shift. Um, and what, is, what have been the results for you and your family and community? Uh, I think I'm a bad idea. I think I fork and the tongue is from any age. I feel like I agree on a good one. I took back, won't do, for one way, lay more, won't do, as is a poor detail. I'm a man for two years. What you want from other fun, but I do not hear by no fool. Don't win the messy on three two. I don't see where people won't see the very situation. Okay, <laughs> Ok, je vous remercie beaucoup et remercie les organisateurs. Et elle dit que elle, elle était dans le coton conventionnel, mais à un moment donné, elle avait beaucoup de problèmes de santé. Il y avait, quand après le, le traitement, elle avait des démangeaisons sur la peau. Il y avait aussi les, les précautions à prendre. Il y avait trop de précautions à prendre avant d'aller utiliser un produit chimique. Elles avaient des précautions endogènes comme aller acheter de lait et non sucré, boire pour atténuer les effets de pesticides. Mais elle a compris que ça n'avait pas d'effet. Il y avait aussi les enfants, la sécurité des enfants, puisque les enfants sont en même temps à la maison quand c'est les vacances et les accompagnent au champ. Donc, quand vous êtes, c'est leur lieu de travail en même temps, le, le lieu de divertissement des enfants, mais c'était devenu un lieu dangereux pour leurs enfants. Et même pour stocker les produits à la maison, c'était dangereux. Un enfant pouvait s'amuser et se faire mal. Donc, au vu de tout ça, elle a changé quand elle a eu l'information des pratiques agroécologiques, elle a changé. Et comme bénéfice, elle peut, et toutes les spéculations qu'il y a dans son champ, elle peut chercher directement à les préparer, manger. Alors qu'avant, avec les produits chimiques, ce n'était pas possible pour elle. Et ses enfants sont en sécurité, elle est sûre maintenant qu'ils ne ils vont pas faire de manipulation dangereuse de produits chimiques qui va affecter qui pourrait affecter leur santé. Donc, au vu de tout ça, parce qu'au moment où elle devenait bio, les enfants, tous ces enfants étaient petits. Merci. Thank you so much for sharing that and congratulations. That is a big transformation you made in your life and on your farm to support your children's health, your health and the well-being of your community. Um, it's very impressive to see you make how you were able to make this change. Um, was there, uh, what was especially helpful to you in making that transition um, to organic farming? Did you, were you able to learn from other farmers or were there other resources provided to you? How was that transition? Um, and yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ok, elle vous remercie pour la question. Elle dit que, en fait, elle a entendu parler de, de bio à travers un technicien de terrain qui était là, qui était un agent de l'Obopab et qui lui a démontré par des, à travers des rencontres que c'était possible de se convertir à l'agroécologie, à produire autrement le coton. Dès qu'elle a entendu ça, elle a, dès qu'elle a entendu, Aussitôt, elle s'était intéressée parce qu'elle avait déjà trop de, de difficultés dans l'utilisation des produits chimiques. Aussitôt, elle a saisi cette opportunité, que c'était une opportunité pour elle, elle qu'elle avait saisie en même temps pour entrer dans l'agriculture biologique, pour adopter des pratiques agroécologiques. Yes, yes, thank you. I was just pausing if there was more, but thank you so much. Yes, I am just very delighted and inspired to hear about uh, your own journey in this. And thank you again so much for, for doing the, the beautiful practices that you are doing, which is a benefit for all of us on the earth, um, as well as the community in Jija, in Benin. All right, thank you so much, Madame Oku. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, in the second round. So for now, I will move us to our conversation with Patty Naylor. Patty farms in Iowa, in the Midwest of the United States. Patty has also transitioned to organic farming over the years and um, is active in national and global movements for agroecology and for food and farm justice. So we're very happy to have Patty with us today. And um, we're also very honored uh, that Patty serves as a member of the board of Pesticide Action Network North America. Um, so thank you for joining us, Patty. I will put up the video that you provided to us of your activities on your farm. Hi, my name is Patty Naylor. I am a farmer in Iowa, which is in the central part of the United States, considered the Corn Belt. It was seven years ago that my husband and I made the decision to transition our farm to organic. It was this orchard that I'm standing in right now to help make that decision. So it was with the idea of agroecology and the science of, e of ecology that really helped us to make the decision that certified organic was the way to go. Uh, I'd like to take you on a tour of our farm and hold on. This is one of the new orchards that we planted six and a half years ago. To be organic and agroecological, we do a number of things to um, to combat the insect uh, pressures that we have. We do monitoring. We do uh, targeted spraying with uh, natural products such as neem oil and kale and clay to attract pollinators. Uh, we have um, medicinal and culinary herbs planted amongst the trees. And we have a, you can see in the distance, there is a prairie section that has lots of flowers in there during most of the year. Here we are in the orchard that we planted just this past spring. It's more than double the size of the orchards, the two orchards that we planted six and a half years ago. Um, I also planted strawberries and um, also some garden vegetables between the trees in the space that we have. You can see there in the distance so that line of trees is our farmstead. Um, the apple orchard that I was standing in earlier is on the other side of that. And across the way, right there, is the cornfield that my husband harvested uh, just the last couple of days. Um, it's an organic cornfield. So we've added um, oats and hay to the soy, soybean and corn rotations. We also use cover crops uh, that, that both provide weed control and provide nitrogen. We're surrounded by friends and neighbors who grow almost exclusively genetically engineered corn and soybeans. And it's the policies that we have, including free trade agreements, that really lock them into that, that um, mode of production. And that's why agroecology is so important. It has that political policy aspect to it that we really need to include. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you as well, Patty, so much for the time you took to make that video for us. I know it was 
challenging, windy days, weather, farming, all that is happening. Um, so we appreciate both that and your spending the time this morning with us. So Patty, you are quite unique among your friends and neighbors in your commitment to organic farming and agroecology. I wonder if you could tell us more about what motivated you to stop using pesticides. And then also what was most helpful in your transition to agroecology and what has been or perhaps remains still difficult? Oh, thank you. Greetings to everyone here. I'm very honored to be amongst um, the guests here. And I think it's wonderful that agroecology can bring us all together like this. My primary motivation to stop using pesticides came when I watched my husband handling the liquid herbicides that it was going to use on a soybean field. And I realized how much direct contact the farmers um, have with these toxic chemicals. I combined that with the, the, my mother's skin rash that she developed whenever she was near glyphosate. And the pesticide drift that continues to occur here in Iowa, drifting onto neighboring gardens, orchards, fields, and even homes. And the decision to stop no, using pesticides was easily the right one to make. As my husband and I were also making plans to pass this farm on to the next generation, we knew that the chemical laden corn and soybeans would not inspire young people to return to this farm. Of course, we also knew that pesticides harmed the environment and human health on a global scale. The introduction of genetically engineered seeds has resulted in an onslaught of toxic pesticides and has spread monoculture crops and plantations across the globe while replacing and disrupting the local crops, cultures, and natural ecosystems. Although we had never planted genetically engineered crops, we no longer wanted to be accomplices to this system. We learned that imp implementing the principles of agroecology are the only way to farm responsibly. And we all need to take agroecology seriously. Thus, we were eager to demonstrate on our farm the change that needs to become the reality for all farmers. And we began the process to turn to, to organic certification. Already, we have found that our farm is a much more beautiful place to live for us, and we hope for the future generations as well. We have found that to step outside the industrial model of agriculture and to farm in an ecologically sound way is a long-term process that is sometimes difficult. <clears throat> it is much more than changing a few practices, which, is, which are the small ineffective steps that agribusiness instructs conventional farmers, including our friends and neighbors, to do when it becomes evident that their industrial farming methods are polluting the water and eroding the land. Our farm is not completely agroecological yet. We are still learning how to control weeds and insects without pesticides. We have established native plants to attract pollinators, and we have planted trees and perennials on our farm. However, the most difficult challenge is integrating livestock under our farm, other than a few chickens. Returning farm animals to farms instead of the confinement facilities that have become the norm is vital to changing this industrial system. It is a challenge for us because we don't have the skills nor the physical structures needed, but also the global free trade market keeps livestock feed, including the corn and soybeans, at low prices for the corporate owners of the livestock so that raising animals responsible, so that raising animals in unsustainable and unecological ways is most profitable. In this model, the true costs of food are not accounted for and farmer like me, who wants to raise livestock responsibly, finds it difficult to be financially viable. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing your experiences and um, powerful story of change that you have been undertaking quite courageously and creatively and with, with passion and much power um, on your farm. So thank you. You and George are also an inspiration to, to all of us. Um,
bringing us models of how we can be doing agriculture differently in the United States as well. So now, um, dear friends, I think we do have time for a second round of questions. Feel free, um, our attendees, to drop in any questions you have. Uh, at the moment, we just we have one specific one about. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, some supports from the government to Madame Oku. So I'll I'll. And integrate that into um, this second round of questions. So um, let's see if we go back to Marcella. Um, Signora Marcella, uh, coming back to your description of your El Cuerto Interior and your, your family farm, can you tell us a bit about how your family um, is organized, how you organize your roles for the management of the farm? you and all your siblings, um, and how also you relate to other producers in the territory, in your area. Estamos. Eh, un poquito, eh, todos mm, realizamos todas las actividades, pero bueno, tenemos ahí como roles eh, más específicos, donde mi hermano está más encargado de la parte eh, productiva o, o técnica específicamente, Digamos, eh, a mí me toca parte de lo que sería la elaboración y la comercialización, digamos, de, de preparar, eh, específicamente en el caso de la harina, preparar todo lo que son los pedidos y eso, y bueno, y después mi hermana, la parte de eh, entrega de la mercadería. Eso un poquito ahí los roles en, en la actividad, pero en realidad este, los tres hacemos todo. <risa> Eh, y después en relación a, a los roles con el contexto, digamos, el primer contacto que nosotros empezamos a tener eh, eh, desde el cambio de modelo, en realidad eh, estamos en, en el corazón de La Pampa y, y bueno, era una mosca blanca ¿no? el, el proyecto nuestro y este, este cambio eh, productivo. Y el, con los primeros que nos empezamos a contactar, en realidad es con una escuela, una escuela de alternancia, un CPT, eh, donde empezamos a interactuar con, con los alumnos, con los docentes. En la escuela, digamos, la mayoría de, eh, del alumnado eh, son productores pequeños, son eh, campesinos. Entonces la relación ahí empezó a ser, digamos, más... Eh, fluida y empezamos a generar redes eh, con ellos. A raíz de eso se genera lo que sería la mesa ovina de General Viamonte, donde participan otros productores pequeños también de la producción ovina, eh, parte del alumnado, parte de un telar este, mapuche que, que hay en la comunidad, eh, ¿no? en esto de, de generar la red en, en lo que sería la comercialización de la ganadería ovina. ¿no? Eso por, por un lado. Eh, y después empezamos a eh, conectarnos con, con el contexto más externo en relación a las ferias. En realidad con los productores no nos fue muy fácil, porque bueno... Eh, no, no es fácil que nos cambien el, el modelo, porque uno tiene que eh, transitar todo un proceso de, de aprendizaje. ¿no? Uno eh, con el modelo agroindustrial viene con el concepto productivista, de productor, ¿no? y el modelo agroecológico nos lleva eh, y a, a, a un concepto que yo tengo más eh, internalizado o que quiero fortalecer y dar a conocer más a este concepto de la agricultura, ¿no? del agricultor y salir del productor, porque el modelo agroindustrial te lleva al productor a esta mirada más eh, extractivista, en cambio el modelo agroecológico nos conecta con, con la agricultura propiamente dita, dicha, si uno va a la etimología de la palabra, agricultura, digamos, estamos hablando de la cultura del agro, de la cultura del campo, de, y, y cuando yo hablo de cultura, estoy hablando del campesino, estoy hablando del arraigo, estoy hablando de las raíces, estoy hablando de, eh, del cultivo, del cultivarse. Entonces yo me, re, me, me relaciono, digamos, eh, 
desde otro lugar, eh, cuando incorporo este concepto, eh, a la, eh, el concepto de agricultura y no de productor, o de agricultora y no de productor, eh, en, genera uno más un, un empoderamiento al campesinado y, y otra, otra relación, porque yo es como que lo estoy empoderando en, en un abanico de posibilidades al otro. Eh, y, y bueno, en el, en, propiamente dicho, digamos, al, al modelo, a los vecinos, eh, bueno, no nos fue fácil, recién ahora estamos siendo como mirados desde otro lugar, empoderados, eh, y, y todo lo que uno fue eh, sembrando y mm, generando redes, eh, por ejemplo, con, con el alumnado del, de la escuela, que los chicos puedan aprender otro modelo. Nosotros tenemos habilitado el espacio para que los chicos hagan las prácticas profesionalizantes, eh, porque bueno, consideramos que la educación en este modelo es fundamental, que los chicos puedan tener digamos, eh, otra mirada sobre la agricultura, que existe otro modelo, que hay otra posibilidad, que uno, digamos, en, eh, empodera al buen vivir. En, bueno, eso es lo que eh, nos lleva también adelante y nos impulsa cada vez más a, a año a año ir incre incrementando la cantidad de hectáreas. Porque, bueno, nosotros hectáreas que empezamos con la huerta, después empezamos a incorporar poquitas hectáreas, la hectárea que recuperamos no tiene nada de químicos de síntesis, entonces digamos ya en este proceso de, de nueve años, ya llevamos 60 hectáreas que no tienen nada de químicos de síntesis, bueno y todo ese eh, modelo, eh, bueno es como que uno lo va llevando a cabo e incorporando día a día digamos otros saberes, Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. And thank you so much, Señor Marcela. Uh, you have really made a beautiful picture. You have shown us how the, uh, the agroecology is culture and society, and it has so many levels from physical to spiritual to how we relate to each other and the land to the youth, to the education um, at all these levels. It is truly a, transform, a transformative process you have described. Thank you so much. Um, now we will go, I think we are getting many questions coming up in the chat. So I will try to integrate these uh, in, this, in this last round. Um, so coming back to Ms. Kali Marutan. We I had a question for you about how COVID and climate changes, um, such as the unpredictability of seasonal rains, has affected your community. Um, I think there are, just check, some other questions from the audience um, interested in knowing whether you have received, there are any incentives or support given to you by uh, the government or other places to assist in transitioning to or practicing uh, agroecological farming. So how has the situation of COVID or climate change affected you? How have you been able to respond? And have you had um, any supports from other places um, yeah, in making these, in adapting to the changing conditions? <laughs> Ipa Palikura le Chuma Halab Lega Kiregere Valarikum Yirikina Corona Garna Lena Papa Ipa Adur Karagata Madri or Savira Lata Madri Linda Halab Lega Boy Halab Lega Palikura di Parikina Ipa Samavira Hitikum Valarikum Yirikina Adik untuk ini, kita nama, kard kita itu, ini pulle garis, sahme, rai, piri kita itu kita kerjakan. Hmm, tak ada di corona pun tu. Ada te pandi, sahme, rai, ul, itu ni allah wait, nampa, apun pulle garis allah, kard kita untuk ini, apa beresnya pulle garis. Paling kurang latar kondo, 
பிரிக்கி ஓட்டி கொண்டிருக்கினா சொல்லுங்க ஆ ஷீ இஸ் சேயிங் தட் கோவிட் டஸ் டசன்ட் अफेக்ட் us மோர் बिकॉज திஸ் இஸ் வி ஆர் பிராக்டிசிங் आवर ட்ரெடிஷனல் அக்ரிகல்ச்சர் ஆல்சோ திஸ் கோவிட் டைம் கோவிட் டசன்ட் अफेக்டட் கோவிட் டசன்ட் अफेக்டட் தட் மச் us Uh, this time we are doing uh, this covid time our children doesn't have any school facilities or class facilities something like that uh, we are teaching them how to practice our traditional agriculture through our traditional ways and we are practicing how to protect our crops from the birds and animals like that in this covid time is very lucky for us to teach our uh, next generation what is our traditional agriculture and what are the practices and also also this is our first uh, crop harvesting time they are practicing uh, practicing and participate with us how to uh, take harvest children are taking responsibility for uh, the traditional agriculture they are practicing and also they are participate with us like us sir kyaru sagaya sigar அதாவது சீகாத நேரத்தை இரண்டு வருஷம் கூடி எல்லாமே நாம் தொடர்ந்து சேர்க்கலாம் நாம் முப்பது வருஷம் கொண்டு எல்லா புட்டா தொழிலுனை எடுத்து கிளீனா செய்து பாருங்க எருபுனை மின்னுக்கும் காடு பட்டி தெளிக்காது பங்குனி மாசா காடு பட்டி தெளிக்கா பங்குனி மாசா காடை பட்டி தெளித்து சுட்டு அதெல்லாம் இருப்படி பண்ணித்து ஏர் ஓட்டுவார் மாடு ஏரை ஓட்டி கொஞ்ச நாளைக்கு அதே பூமினே ஊறுக வைக்க ஊறுக வைத்தாரும் மே வந்தாரும் விதைக்காது ஏன்னா அது விதைக்காது ஆதிய ராய் விதைக்கா ராய விதைத்துட்டு சாமை சாமினை விதைத்துட்டு தொகையாரி இது மூணு மின்னுக்கு விதைத்தா இது எத்தனை மேசாத்தி வரவு மூணு மேசாத்து ஒய்யாசி மேசாக்கு போட்டா ஊனா மேசாக்கு அடிக்கல சரி சரி கவர்மெண்ட் இஸ் சப்போர்ட்டிங் அஸ் கேரளா கவர்மெண்ட் இன் இந்தியா அவர் கேரளா கவர்மெண்ட் ஷெட்யூல்ட் ட்ரைப்ஸ் டெவலப்மெண்ட் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் சப்போர்ட்டிங் அஸ் ஃபார் அவர் ட்ரெடிஷனல் ட்ரைபல் அக்ரிகல்ச்சர் தே ஆர் கிவிங் சம் பினான்சியல் சப்போர்ட் அண்ட் டெக்னிக்கல் சப்போர்ட் ஃப்ரம் தேர் சைட் Uh, one of the reason uh, that we stopped our traditional agriculture before 30 years after 30 years this two years we are doing our traditional agriculture because of by the supporting of our scheduled tribes development department and they are also providing our uh, providing youth support and financial support uh, we lost our traditional crops recently they help to help to uh, take back our traditional crops and the government giving very very helpful for our traditional agriculture also they are supporting to rec- uh, recover our revive our traditional uh, cultural practices uh, regarding our traditional agriculture also we revived our traditional uh, culture named kutu and kutu is uh, called as our Uh, spiritual and art form of uh, spiritual art form relating our tradition agriculture so government is supporting us very much and we are thanking to our government kerala scheduled tribes development department thank you thank you thank you miss kali and thank you baratan for the translation um that is very wonderful to hear all the dimensions of of your agriculture your agroecology your culture and uh practices and also very encouraging to hear that the government in this case of kerala uh specifically is providing um such good support uh it seems like a very powerful collaboration and i hope that more local governments and even state and national governments will take notice uh we also hope that the united nations and and other policy makers will take notice of what you have been doing um in the atapadi valley it's a good an inspiration for all of us and policy makers can learn a lot from what they are seeing what you are doing thank you um all thank right we we will go to our um madam oku now um 
I'm also keeping an eye on the questions from the chat. I will try to integrate as we go along. Um, Madam Oku, can you please share with us the leading role that you are playing in your cooperative, which comprises both men and women? You are the president of this cooperative, um, which is quite impressive. So please tell us about the role you play with your cooperative, how it came about, uh, and what are some of the difficulties you encountered along the way and how have you overcome them? As Madam Oku speaks in Fongbei and Delphine translates into French, then you will get your translation. You can listen to her by unmuting your audio, original audio. Okay, Rosaline, I would like to thank you for this reunion. I would like to thank you for the cooperative. It's true, she is the leader of the cooperative, but it's a question of cohesion social. It's a question of collaboration active with all the members. She doesn't decide herself. She doesn't take herself the decisions. It's in a participative way with all the members that all the decisions are taken. Pour ce qui est des difficultés du moment où c'est elle qui est la première eh, représentante du, du groupement, toutes les difficultés retombent d'abord sur elle. Mais elle ne refuse pas. Du moment où elle n'exclut personne, elle n'a pas une politique d'exclusion. Même quand il y a quelque chose, c'est la voix de la majorité qui l'emporte et finalement la coopérative se porte bien. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. We did hear you. Um, great. And uh, does she have, uh, does Madam Oku, do you have some plans or expectations for the future with your cooperative and your community? Oh. Oui, elle dit que comme perspective pour le futur, il y a la durabilité du processus, la durabilité de leur coopérative. Donc, c'est comment intéresser les jeunes, les, la génération montante, à prendre la relève même quand ils vont complètement vieillir et même quand ils ne seront plus de ce monde, pour que les activités bio au sein de la communauté et durent dans le temps et dans l'espace et prennent plus d'ampleur dans la commune, dans sa commune. Mm. Yes, thank you. Well, we look forward to hearing more from you in the days and months and years ahead as your work continues. Um, and thank you once again so much for, for sharing your experiences with us. All right, we have time. And uh, now we will go to Patty um, for our last set of questions. Patty, as you said in your video, agroecology is also political. So can you tell us more about that and your activism and leadership as a woman and a family farmer in the United States and in global food sovereignty movements? What needs to change and what brings you hope? Thank you, Marcia. Um, 
What brings me hope are the social movements that are embracing agroecology. Agroecology goes beyond organic, regenerative, and sustainable because it includes a political education component built through these social movements. That political analysis allows us to understand the agriculture and food systems as they exist and how to challenge those systems. For example, the World Trade Organization and the free trade agreements take away each country's ability to achieve food sovereignty and to implement policies that support agroecology. Farmers now must compete on a global scale in a downward spiral to produce more and more, but receive less and less for their products. The beneficiaries of this system are the corporate users of our products and the seed, chemical, and technology companies. Through the US Food Sovereignty Alliance and the National Farm Coalition, I became involved in the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. In the process of developing guidelines for countries to promote agroecology, some influential countries, including the United States, and the agribusiness interests have demanded, the demanded that the text read agroecology and other innovations. In this context, the other innovations refers to high tech, including biotechnologies and the data, data collection technologies. In contrast, the innovations of a farmer who follows the principles of agroecology can come from his or her own creativity and ingenuity, as well as ancestral knowledge and lived experiences, all combined to solve their problems. And these new ideas then are passed on to others through farmer to farmer models of learning. In the past few years, my husband and I have joined delegations to Cuba and to Nicaragua to learn from the farmers there. They form cooperatives, as we've heard already, where they work together to produce and market healthy food. Cooperatives by the, by the women, especially those in Nicaragua, are inspiring and hopeful, showing a better way to grow food and to connect with community. But here in the United States, agroecology is not well known. It is often misunderstood and it's being co-opted by agribusiness industry. I'm happy that we have changed the, our farm in the direction that we have towards agroecology, but we also must continue to educate our friends and our neighbors, in fact, all of society to grow this movement so that one day soon, all of our agroecology, all of our agriculture can be agroecological. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Such a powerful vision. We are so fortunate here in the United States and in North America to have you representing the voice of family farmers here in these United Nations um, uh, convenings at the UN, at the UN Committee on Food Security. Um, Patty represents uh, the North America contingent of the civil society mechanism in this UN process. And it's so powerful to have the voices of farmers speaking directly in these you know, on the floor of the intergovernmental plenary meetings, explaining really, particularly when our US government representatives may be saying, we have to feed the world with GMOs, with genetically engineered crops and pesticides. Then you have someone like Patty, um, you have the experiences of others on our panel saying that, yeah, no, actually, we can do it another way. We can do it through agroecology. We can feed and nourish ourselves in a way that protects our planet and uh, protects our communities. So thank you so much for all that you are doing in those spaces. I'm just looking now if there are any other questions, I will turn to my co-host, Chloe, to see if there are any other questions that we would like to um, pose to the panelists. We've not been able to cover every, every question. Thank you so much um, to our attendees for dropping your questions into the chat. Okay, um, yeah, I think one question that um, any farmer that wants to answer can, it's more of a general, how do you see agroecology becoming a large scale way of feeding the world? And then also what kind of policy changes would that require? I can add a little bit to that though. I think there's other people who know more about it than I do. Um, when we talk about large scale um, 
I don't think, I think it's possible, but I don't think that should be the goal. I think there needs to be a transition so that the farmers that we have, <clears throat> the, the agriculture that we have today is going to have to transition in some way. Um, and that needs to be smooth as possible. Uh, and policies that uh, address the prices that farmers receive and the trade agreements are all going to have to be part of that. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, we are coming up on the hour. So just before I close us out, I'd like to just offer an opportunity if any of our dear panelists have you know, one last um, something you would like to share with our audience today. Um, feel free to jump in, unmute yourself and, and share if there's something else you would like to, to say. And as well, I'll open up this moment. We have many co-organizers, partners behind the scenes from Pan Latin America, Rapal, um, Javier is there, Davo in Benin with Opepap, um, Jayan with Pan India and our colleagues in Tanal. So was there a question or comment from any of our panelists or fellow organizers? If not, I will. Eh, a mí me gustaría, digamos, este, ya que, bueno, todos los panel, panelistas eh, somos mujeres y, y me da la, que, digamos, no es un dato menor, eh, poder eh, enfocar de la, la, la importancia y el compromiso y la responsabilidad que tenemos como, como mujeres eh, porque si uno se va a la naturaleza, la especie, la hembra, es la que eh, transmite y la que da el alimento. ¿no? Entonces, si lo llevamos a, a nosotras como mujeres, somos las encargadas de, de nutrir y la importancia eh, de esa nutrición y de la responsabilidad desde ese lugar. ¿no? Y todo lo que significa nutrición, porque tenemos que hablar de educación, de, de la educación en todo el extracto, no necesariamente, ¿no? desde toda la familia, eh, para tener también, digamos, otra sociedad diferente. Eh, la, la elección de lo que uno, del, del alimento que uno consume, también depende eh, de nuestra elección. Nosotras también como mujeres tenemos este poder de, de compra, de elección, de qué es lo que vamos a consumir. Eh, me parece muy importante eh, esta, esta parte de, de la nutrición desde, de, desde los valores, desde el ser y este compromiso eh, que tenemos como mujeres como para generar digamos, o co-crear una realidad diferente, un mundo diferente para todas y todos, por supuesto. ¿no? Thank you. Marcela, that is beautiful. It's a, the perfect conclusion to our time together. Um, I will just be, I know we're at time, and so I will just be closing us out, but I noticed that I think Ms. Kali also had something to say. Is that correct? Yes, Madam, may I? Please. Kali Mardin, I have a message to the viewers. Sulam. मकसोड़ी सपोर्ट and she is saying that uh, she is very happy and she is also give a message to the uh, younger generation and the viewers you have to do the uh, your agriculture practice with traditionally and non 
they are, don't use pesticides you have to eat properly and good food and you have to make good food and thank you thank you so much good words of wisdom and advice for all of us miss kali thank you Okay. okay. Well, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all for a very rich conversation. Your experiences as farmers growing food for your families and communities while practicing agroecology is incredible inspiration for all of us. So you have shown us today how agroecology offers many different unique pathways of liberation from the harms of hazardous pesticides, um, offers an alternative way forward for our children, our communities and environments. You have shown us the power of women in the forefront of change, paving the way towards equitable, nourishing and healthy food and farming systems for all. A deep thank you to Ms. Kali, Senora Marcella, Madam Oku and my dear friend Patty for your time today. Many thanks to our interpreters and translators, Amelia and Fanny, from Co-op Largo in Montreal, Canada, Paul and Patri from Colectivo Babia in New York and Puerto Rico, Delphine from Obepop, the Benin Organization for the Promotion of Organic Agriculture, Baratan from Tanal Trust in Kerala, India, Rina from Pan UK, and Tucker from Pan North America. Thank you also to my wonderful co-host and co-producer Chloe Cho and to the members of the Pan International Agroecology Workgroup and additional Pan partners who together made this webinar possible. Pan India, Tanal Trust, Obepab, Rapal, or Pan Latin America, Pan UK, Pan Ethiopia, and my colleagues here at Pan North America. Finally, a warm thank you to our co-sponsors, AFSA, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, the African Center for Biodiversity, the West Africa Organic Network, Mayela, or the Agroecology Movement of Latin America and the Caribbean, India's National Coalition for Natural Farming, the U.S. National Family Farm Coalition, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, Third World Network, Service Trust, 11th Hour Project, and the Agroecology Fund. You will be able to find more information at our websites, many of which are listed here, so please do take a look. We look forward to continuing this conversation in the days to come. And before we close, I would like to invite all of our panelists, interpreters, and co-organizers of this webinar to turn on your cameras, if you like, so that we can see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to all of you who have attended, it's been truly an honor to be in your presence and to be working alongside you in this movement. Just Letting you know also that there will be another webinar by PAN next month in November that will be focusing on the issue of highly hazardous pesticides. So stay tuned for more information about that. Thank you again from my heart. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. <laughs>